I just want to introduce Pam Perry from the Arizona Herb Association. She's going to be doing a presentation today on um, seed saving and collecting. My name is Aubrey and I work over at the Chandler Sunset Library. So I welcome you all this evening. Um, part of the reason we really wanted to get a, um, a workshop like this in the books is because Chandler Sunset Library has recently started a seed library. Um, and we're really excited to, to share that with the community um, and, and to allow people to learn how to save seeds from their own gardens. So it's really exciting. And I wanna thank Pam for, for presenting tonight. Um, and uh, we are recording. So if you know someone who maybe wants to watch this, we will have it on our website probably within a few days. Um, and we definitely encourage people to go on and uh, view the presentation. And um, I think, that's probably all I've got. If um, I did send an email out earlier with a few uh, documents that we wanted to share. Um, and if you didn't get that and you do, just go ahead and either shoot me an email or send me a direct message in the chat and I'll send those to you um, probably tomorrow. And I think last thing is if you aren't muted, um, you might want to mute yourself just while Pam is talking. Um, if you have any questions, you can definitely put them in the chat box and we'll, we'll either get to those during the presentation or, or at the end. So thank you, everyone. I'll let Pam take over now. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. It was kind of fun to see some of you walking into the room, so to speak. Um, so we're doing seed collecting and seed saving. This is a picture of me at the demonstration herb garden at Maricopa County Cooperative Extension. It is one of the places we save seed from. And when I got to thinking about saving seed, um, people, early generations, early evolutions of people started collecting seed, grains, nuts, pods, roots, as something to eat. It was primarily a, a harvest project. As they became more sophisticated in keeping body and soul together, and they kind of had routines and paths they followed regularly, they actually started planting them and so that plants would be there in quantities they could use when they made the cycle through their hunting and gathering cycles. And eventually, that evolved into agriculture and we became, as we grew more and more plants, we got rather sophisticated and made efforts to be very choosy about what seeds we selected from what plants. And to this day, there are vegetables as well as herbs that show up at our tables that certainly the Greeks and Romans would recognize. And I dare say there's some that even early man would know as well. We have been agriculture, we've been growing some of those heirloom and open pollinated seeds and they haven't changed all that much in that many centuries. But if we fast forward to the 1940s, hybridization became much more sophisticated and we began doing a great deal more commercial agriculture. And we were looking for parameters for plants that would meet the needs of growing on a very large scale. Um, as that developed, farmers took advantage of new hybrids, but let some of the old heirloom grow plants that they'd been growing sort of get lost to history. But again, by the mid 20th century, home gardeners in particular promoted the preserving of family and heirloom varieties by actively saving and sharing seeds among the, each other. Um, I used to find a little advertisement in the back of Horticulture Magazine for seed savers. And if you sent them a stamped self-addressed envelope, they would slip in a mimeographed sheet of the few varieties of seeds that were hand and home collected of these heirloom varieties that weren't available 
in the big garden catalogs that showed up in January. And now they have an equally glossy and plump catalog, no more mimeograph sheets, and they have fostered seed saving all around the world. There's other organizations that have worked very hard and other catalog groups that work very hard to preserve the older varieties as well. And it became sufficiently popular that even those seed companies which had been promoting primarily hybrids, many of which they had a hand in, they began to include the old heirloom varieties back in their catalogs as well. So we have a far greater collection of plants that we can order seed for, but that doesn't mean we should stop saving our own seed. It's a, it's a quiet little insurance program that we can maintain in our own backyards and side yards and front yards and share with friends and neighbors. So today we're going to cover six general points and I'm going to kind of spell out what are, I mean, very subjective description of cell sowing plants and seed collecting versus seed saving. And we're going to talk about characteristics for the good plants, the things we want to save seed for, and about when plants are ready to make their seed and when seed is actually ripe enough to harvest, and yes, it should be. Some of the challenges we as desert gardeners face, um, if you start reading books by people who save seed in other parts of the country, they face a collection of challenges. Ours are unique to us. And so as we become more sophisticated in saving seed, we learn how to manage those challenges. Um, it's important that we isolate plants so we know what we're saving seed for, that we label and store our seeds properly and well, and that we have a good grow out rotation, you know, last one in, first one out kind of thing so that you don't have seed aging to death in the back of the cupboard while you're grabbing last year's seed only. And we'll talk about testing for seed viability so that we know that what we plant will actually grow in our gardens when we plant it. So first and foremost, cell sowing plant. This is sort of the lazy gardener's way of saving seed. Um, once plants are allowed to mature to the point of flower and making seed, the seed is allowed to disperse naturally. It scatters in the wind or um, with help of the gardener at some times. And it germinates pretty much as it will in future months. And there are many plants I've left go to seed. And just to track when exactly it is that they are most likely to volunteer in the garden. We have calendars to help us learn and judge when to plant seed, but sometimes our climate and the calendar are not on the same page. So if I've got a few beans that have escaped and before I got them harvested as dry beans and they start showing up a little ahead of the calendar or a little behind the calendar, it sort of helps guide when I choose to plant the bulk of the crop. So it does eliminate a middler step or two, it, but when you're just letting things kind of go to seed, there are definitely losses possible. Um, the seed could get damaged while being in the soil for any number of causes. Um, sometimes there's some identification challenges. If you don't remember what seedlings look at, they can get weeded out in a hurry. So, or you end up letting everything get big enough to identify and discover you have more weeds than you have plants you were hoping to find. If we are letting a whole batch of lettuces, for instance, go to seed, and we've got three or four variety of lettuces going to seed, each little lettuce is, a, is, is, is pretty much the same family and genus, but they've all been selected over the years for the color and texture of their leaves and their growth habits and their flavors. So you might get some cross pollination and the lettuce that volunteers will be familiar, but he won't be an exact replica of, a, of, of any one parent, but sort of a hybrid of whoever happened to be met by the same bee. 
one of the challenges I find in the garden is sometimes they do volunteer, but they're not growing in a really good location for them to become a harvestable crop. So they either have to be moved or forfeited. So some days we get way more than we need and we have to make those executive decisions on which ones we select to keep. And other times we don't get nearly enough to get a decent crop. So we have to come back in and sow some more seed anyway. So those are sort of the basic challenges of letting things self sow, but in my gardens, I've always had a variety of plants cheerfully self-sowing. Um, I call it lazy gardening, but it offers a little bit of interest to the garden and you never know quite what you're going to get and where you're going to get it. So that's kind of fun. I try not to let things take over and crowd out those plants that I really want to have grow, even if I'm planting directly and not leaving just the self-sowers. Seed collecting. It's quick and it's easy. I call it my itchy thumb syndrome. And I've walked by any number of little plants making seeds and I'm, hmm, I wonder if I can get these to grow. It's very spontaneous. It's a bit haphazard. Some days they end up in a pocket. Some days they end up in a pocket wrapped in a little bit of paper if I've got it. Some days they end up in a pocket with a little bit of paper. And I've made a few notes like what garden or what location I have gathered them from and what plant I think they might actually be. But sometimes it's just a real guess as to who you're really getting seed for, which makes it a little challenging sometimes to get them planted and get them growing happily. But you learn to label things, even if it's mystery plant number one, two, and three, so that you don't weed them out when you've scattered the seed. Um, some of them will come up right away. Some of them, it may be a year or two when you go, hmm. I wonder if you're something I planted a while ago. So it's kind of fun, but it isn't a very exact science at all, but it has introduced things into my garden that maybe I wouldn't ordinarily have acquired. And we save seeds very actively um, for eating. It's a viable crop. Um, herbs, are green leafy plant parts. They're the stems and they are the leaves, maybe the flowers, but spices are seeds and, and bark and the, and the, and the hard coated seed shells. So seeds and spices, absolutely. This is dill season for sure. And the leaf celery is setting seed. Sesame will bloom all summer and set seed late in the summer. Somehow when you've grown your own seed and put it in the spice jar and used it, it is so much fresher and the flavors are so much more incredibly intense. I've bought jars of spices in the grocery store and followed directions in recipes, wondering all the while what the point of that particular part of the recipe was supposed to be all about when they've been jarred for a long time and, and sat in warehouses and finally made it to the, to the grocery store and then finally made it to your spice cupboard and finally made it into a recipe. Sometimes they aren't nearly as flavorful as they might be um, when you're harvesting them fresh. It is certainly an eye-opening experience. But seed, we can definitely allow plants to go to seed and collect our seeds and save our seeds as spices for sure. And we again, the rules are pretty much the same as for seed we intend to plant in the future. You want the seed to be as fully mature on the plant as you can get it, and it should be ripe. And when you harvest it, you keep a label, you know who's who, and what garden it might have come from with a name. And the year is always good. Fresh is best. So last year is two years ago won't be nearly as tasty as what we're harvesting right now this year. And it should be allowed to dry. We're really lucky. I was in Arizona. I looked at the weather today just briefly before I started this. It's 8% humidity. We can dry seeds on our counters. We don't have to go get special dehydrators. We don't have to leave them in low ovens. We can just set them out on a counter in a dish and stir them every so often. And within a few days, they are sufficiently dry to be able to store. And I always, when I'm doing 
seeds as spices. I try to make sure I do get all the debris and chaff out of them so I've got good clean spices and I'm not adding other just stuff into whatever recipe I'm using. Somehow that hard little bit of dill stem just doesn't enhance my sour cream and dill accompaniment to salmon at all. I put them in the freezer for between 24 and 48 hours. This will eliminate insects. It'll in, eliminate life in insect eggs. I'd really rather not have new pests introduced into my pantry. Um, so a few hours in a freezer eliminates most of that challenge. And then I can put them in the spice cabinet where it's nice and cool and dark. And when a recipe calls for celery seed or or sesame seed or dill, I've got those handy and fresh in the cupboard. So they're being stored in a cool, dry place out of sunlight in tightly closed containers. And the memory comment there is when you have fresh spices, use them. You can always harvest more next year. So find ways to use your fresh spices and enjoy them because they do enhance anything we're cooking for sure. If we are saving seed for replanting in another season, we want to think about which plants we're saving seed from. So we're selecting particular varieties for characteristics that are important. And from those varieties, we'll plant lots of seeds. And from the, those that grow, we eliminate anything that's diseased. And from what's still growing at the point of coming into maturity, we choose the actual plants that are demonstrating the characteristics that we really want to save and pass along the next year. Um, sometimes if we're allowing things to go to seed, we are forfeiting a harvest from that crop and or we're certainly reducing the kind of harvest from the crop. So we want to make sure we're allowing additional plants when we sow seed to begin with to give us enough to harvest as whether it's a squash or a cucumber, um, beets or carrots or whatever we're growing and definitely all those leafy greens, but that we have healthy plants that we can just leave until the seed is, is ripe and ready to be harvested. So we're letting those crops go completely mature. I had a carrot going to flower one year in the demo garden and <laughs> one of the staff goes, it's like a crime, you've got a carrot that's blooming. And it's like, yeah, I do. The carrot flower draws beneficial insects and pollinators, but I will be able to harvest carrot seed. And it's like, oh my God, it never occurred to me that you wouldn't just eat all your vegetables. You'd actually let them, oh, what a thought that was. It was, she was dumbfounded at the concept. So yes, we can let seeds go when you don't get to pick and eat the carrot, but you have lots of carrot seeds for, for another season. But you have to make sure that that whole cycle of maturity is completed. You don't want to interrupt it part way. Um, when you've got your seed collected, the next trip is to dry it. And again, if it's really lightweight seed, maybe you leave it upside down in the paper bag that you collected it in with, with a, a Sharpie pen, label that bag with the variety and the, and the crop, lettuce, oak leaf, 2021, dill, um, bouquet, 2021. When they are fully dry, you can then, like we do for the herbs and spices seeds, we will clean them, we will freeze them, and then we will store them in airtight containers in as cool and dark a place as we can find. Some of us have refrigerator space available. Some of us do not. So we look for a cool closet, not a hot closet, perhaps. A shelf where they are close enough that we remember we have them. And we work on, as we plan and plant our gardens, reaching into that cover and bringing out the older seed and using that and making sure that we keep viable seed in our stash so that we don't get caught out with just dead seeds. So when and how and how do we figure this out? Plants have life cycles. 
Annuals are plants that complete the sprout, flower, and seed cycle in less than a year. Their whole purpose in being is to bloom, make flowers, make seed, and die. A lot of the time we spend our time as gardeners interrupting this process and perpetually frustrating them as we harvest a tomato, a squash, a bean, a pea, and we take that into the kitchen and turn it into breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But sooner or later, if we want to collect seed from them, we have to allow some of those fruits to develop to the final end of the story where the seeds are mature and we can harvest the, the fruit and get the seed out of it. Perennials are longer live plants. They will live, some live a few years, some will live many, many, many decades. And each year, as their crowns get bigger and more robust, they send out flowers and, sun and make seeds eventually. And seed, so you get a chance each year to collect fresh seed. You can let them go to seed in the garden too, and then you'll have seedlings, or if they get away from you and escape before you get them collected, you will probably have seedlings of perennials in all kinds of places you hadn't planned on. And you can weed them, and you can, or you can pop them up and share them that way. But if you get in just at the right time, as those, as those seed heads begin to scatter, you can collect that seed. Biennials take anywhere from five to seven seasons. Um, up to almost a year and three quarters to complete their growth cycle. And when they sprout from seeds, they make a small rosette of a plant that over the course of the seasons becomes a larger and more robust rosette. And it finally goes into maybe it starts one spring and the following spring, it's stored enough energy and made enough energy that it has the ability to send up a, a flower stalk that will bloom and set seed, at which point the plant up and dies on you. Um, and you now have seed, and if you get it caught before it scatters, you have the ability to sow that seed in a location where you want the plant to grow again. If you just, if it gets away from you or part of it does, you'll find you have seedlings and little rosettes of interesting plants scattering itself through your garden. You learn to recognize them. Oh, there's a tall evening primrose. That's a parsley. But we must remember that in Phoenix, because of the way our cool season blends to a, a longer day warm season, it can circumvent or telescope that history. So our parsley will go to seed often as not in less than a year. And the parsley plants that I have bought have definitely gone to seed. The parsley I sowed mid-season is now bolting and going to seed. And the young crop were just picking leaves like crazy and scalping it. It, it, it hasn't had a chance to think about whether it's going to go to seed or not. But I suspect if our back is turned and we let it go without harvesting for a week or two, it'll store enough energy that we will get flowers very soon. So some of them need less time than the books tell you they will. So just be aware of that and be ready to jump on the seed making process as it happens so that you've got a good crop to sow the following year. The F1 hybrids, the hybridization that began to become very popular back in the 40s, changed the dynamics of self-sowing plants and of seed collecting. Hybrids, these F1 hybrids, are the final generation of careful plant selection of not only the parents of these plants, but the grandparents of the plants. So they're third, they're second and third generation plants. Some of them, the seed is not even viable. They try to make seed. Some of the hybrid flowers are, have almost no pollen on nectar. They are almost useless if you're trying to bring bees and other pollinating insects and visitors to your garden. So when we're trying to plant for pollinators, we really don't always want to look first at the hybrids. Some of them are really cute. They've been cultivated for very specific characteristics that make them very attractive garden plants, but they aren't necessarily going to reproduce themselves 
quite the same as the one you brought home from the nursery. So the ones that we classically choose, the plants that we classically choose to save seed from are called open pollinated and heirloom. Heirloom plants, some of them date back thousands of years. Some of them, not quite so long. <laughs> My mother grew Morton hybrid tomatoes. It was a tomato developed out of Rutgers University and it did very well in a short, cool growing season, which is what there was in northern Vermont. And she always depended on the Morton hybrid seed that she would get from the catalog. And she'd start her own and she would have nice tomatoes. And then as the heirloom tomato craze really took off, there were just a lot of tomato varieties and the same number of pages in the catalog and certain varieties kind of fell off the edge. The new favorites and the new, the new winners came along to replace them. And yet some people still remembered the Morton hybrid tomato and, and what happened to it. And there was, there was a sort of a, a fan club of, of the tomato Morton hybrids that developed on the East coast in places where the summers were cool and short. So Rutgers went back and revisited what information they had, and they were able to replicate the Morton hybrid, the Morton tomato. And sure enough, it comes back. It's an open pollinated tomato. It will grow. You can save seeds and grow. And they have listed it in their catalogs as, a, as, a, as an heirloom tomato. And I'm looking at this and reading about this tomato of my youth being described as an heirloom and kind of wondering what that makes me, but never mind. So things are not completely lost, even though they may disappear out of the immediate cycle of grow outs for even the, the main seed growers. But we can collect seed from our open pollinated plants and be pretty confident that what we plant is going to look and taste and have the same texture as a, as a vegetable or be as pretty and have the same colors. If it's a flower or a fruit, it will develop in the same ways as what we started with. Um, if you're putting a lot of seeds in the ground, lots and lots and lots of seeds, sometimes you just get something that sprouts that's a little bit different. It's called a sport. If it's different in a good way, you may continue this plant and save seed from it and see if you get more of the same that are different in this good way. If it is not different in a good way and it's different in ways that you don't want, you get rid of it, you pull it out, you sacrifice it. In the seed saving vernacular, it's called roguing it out. It is not true to type and you don't wanna leave it in the garden because if it should pollinate and cross pollinate, the DNA that made it different will be passed through the whole crop. And that may not be something you want to do. If it's something wonderful, you leave it. You may keep it sequestered and, and make something special all your own, which is how so many of our nifty varieties have happened. Um, saving seed is not something you just jump into and, and try to collect seed from everything in the garden all at once. That can be a little overwhelming, but there may be crops that interest you in particular. So research the crop, find out what the steps are for that plant to become mature enough to make seed and how to ensure that the seed will be viable. Um, I went poking around on YouTube the other day to just see what they were saying and you know, there's some really clever videos. There's some very clever people out there. And the the one I watched was saving spinach seed. And he showed, he had his spinach bed and his spinach bed had gone to seed. He was pulling out a bunch of dead stems. Those are the male plants. Spinach are a male and female operation. You get girl plants and boy plants. You've got to have enough spinaches planted that you get some of each or you will get no seeds. So the male plants die after the pollen is used up. 
And so he's pulling out all these dead stems and those would have been the boys. And then he finds the, the stem with all the seeds and he collects his seeds in a, in a bag. And then he goes in to his workshop and he's got a seed cleaning machine and he pours it through. It's a very clever little operation. All the, the chaff and the debris go one way and his seeds land on a hopper at the other end. And he's, you know, some of us are not so uh, good at building things and we may use colanders and sieves and other ways to separate the chaff from the seeds. But learning what to look for and where to find the seeds is important. You can do this through extension sources, catalogs and books, um, Seed Savers catalog, seedsavers.org has great tutorials on saving seeds. Um, we need to plant more plants than if we were just planting for our personal use in the kitchen so that we have extra plants to make those seeds. It may mean an extra row. It may mean just two or three extra large plants taking up space that ordinarily we would plant to a different crop. And we watch them grow. And we want to make sure that none of them are diseased and if a plant gets a disease. And we can see diseases from thrips and aphids carry diseases and sometimes Various other bugs will leave us a diseased insect plant. We rogue them out. We get rid of them. We don't want to pass that disease around the garden. We definitely don't want it infesting our seed. So we watch and allow them to mature and find ways to capture the harvest. The bags that you get at the party stores and sometimes fabric stores for wedding favors. They're kind of really finely woven man-made fabric bags and they've got little ribbon handles on both sides and you pull them and it tightens it right up. They're a great tool for saving seeds of plants. You can buy a bag that fits right over whatever you're trying to capture and pull it tight and put a half knot in it and your seed won't escape when you're not looking. Brown paper bags work pretty well here. The wind and the weather kind of destroys the glue on the seams. You gotta watch that. And if we get rain, they become useless. Um, so you watch them grow. You coddle them a little bit. You may have to fertilize them a little more just because they're being expected to complete the whole growth cycle. Um, and as soon as that seed is ripe, you can harvest it. And when we're talking about doing research and figuring out what are the criteria to determine from which plants we save seed. If we're growing out heirlooms and we're preserving a particular variety, for instance, a Charleston gray watermelon. If you have a dozen watermelon plants and you're looking for watermelons that are quite long and quite slender, and they have this really gray mottled cast to the, they're not really a green skinned, watermelon, they're quite gray and mottled. And the flesh is pinky orange on the inside generally. And you taste it and it's just this wonderful, delightful, fragrant, sweet watermelon that isn't too sugary and too flat. That would be true to type. And that would be the nice thing about that is usually the melon is ripe enough when you pick it that the seeds can be collected and saved. So you're looking for flavor, Texture, tenderness, juiciness. You may be looking for yield. I want something that gives me a lot of beans. I don't want to have to plant seven rows of beans. I want to plant two rows of beans, get enough for some meals and a couple for the freezer. Um, size of fruits. Some things make really tasty fruits, but they're not very large. And some make really large fruits. They might be a blue ribbon fruit at the state fair, but do you really need a three pound eggplant in the kitchen? You know, so select those seed from those plants that are meeting your particular needs and interests for what you're gonna use them for. And again, if they are really tough and disease and insect resistant and are surviving onslaughts of a variety of bugs coming through the garden, and climate resistance. And that's kind of, I think, where a lot of desert gardeners weigh in. They want things that tolerate 
sudden heat or sudden chill. And then like March this year was just up and down. It was, it was a roller coaster. I had three or four spinaches decide that was just too unsettled an environment and they all bolted and went to seed or would have if I had, they went to compost instead. Um, others hung right in. I had one set of chard decide it wasn't really happy with this hot and cold thing and it went to flower. The other chard is just barely now starting to bolt. Size of the plant in pro proportion to the yield. I love it when people tell me about the pumpkin they grew. They had no idea how much pumpkin plant it takes to make one pumpkin. It takes a lot of plant to make one pumpkin. What you want is a variety that makes a lot of yield, maybe in a smaller garden with less plants. So you look at the most productive for the maximum, the minimum amount of space occupied. And is it really what you want? I mean, you, just because you can grow it doesn't mean it is what something you really want to eat. Um, I think growing cute little gourds, all those cute little gourds would be great fun, but then I'd have a bushel basket of gourds. I have no idea what to do with. So I have not grown those cute little gourds. I mean, they look like fun. I did grow those cute little pumpkins one year. They hung around for years. Um, storage life. Most of us here have the ability, because we can plant and harvest year-round, we often just plant and harvest year-round, and we are not really invested in putting it in a root cellar and storing carrots or turnips for the winter. But we can plant another crop of something else and we're always harvesting something fresh. So storage life for desert gardeners may not be a critical issue, whereas the ability to withstand the ups and downs of a desert climate is a more important criteria. So as we're looking at the behavior and the development of the plants, we're going to harvest seed from these are some of the criteria, particularly for vegetables. If you're getting interested in collecting seed from native plants, take a look at them. Some of, I mean, the, the globe mallows, the sterilaceas, the standard color for that plant's bloom is kind of a lovely orange sherbet, but you can find them in the palest pearly pinks and you can find them in orangey scarlets. I've seen them into magenta purples. So do you want different colors or are you happy with that standard lovely orange sherbet? Um, garden flowers. I grow lots and lots of annual flowers over the years. And you know, there's some of them, when you save the seed, they just kind of revert back. Portulaca reverts back to this sort of insipid pink after a while. But if you bring in some fresh seed or some new blood with a couple of six packs, you'll get colorful blooms again. And again, herbs, we can save seed from lots and lots of herbs, but we want to make sure that we're saving the seed from plants that give us a great deal of satisfaction and taste really good and have grown well throughout a season here. So there's lots and lots of plants that make seeds that we can save and and replant in the garden as you're growing out your maturing plants you may need to do some supplemental fertilizer um, a spinach plant that is supposed to be probably coming to the end of its useful life now will need to go for at least another month maybe two it's been in the ground since probably October, early November. And so it has used up the nutrients that were present in the soil. So a little extra fertilizer will give it sufficient energy to make good, good, healthy, vigorous seeds. You don't want a really tired, worn out, stressed plant trying to make seeds because you don't get as healthy a seed to plant the following year. Protecting Seed crops from the insects and birds can be very, very challenging. Um, insects will come, plants that get are old and are, are beginning to run out of their useful life, especially those annuals, are insect man, magnets. I mean, the aphids just, they send out pheromones and hormones and they just call to the pests. So we as gardeners have to be vigilant and make sure their plants remain as healthy as they, as we can keep them until such time as we get our seed. Um, some days, 
there is just not enough fencing to keep the birds away. They love seeds. I mean, we grow sunflowers and we watch them sort through the head and only choose the ones that are just perfect for the bird. They'll sow a lot of sunflower seeds looking for the perfect seed. And they don't like them ripe. They want them a little on the green and too juicy and tender side, actually. So they'll spit out the ones that are a little old, and those are the ones that volunteer and turn into weeds in the garden. When you're co putting, when you're bagging seed heads, you can bag seed heads to help collect them and protect them. Um, net bags, fabric bags, paper bags all work, but plastic is a really poor choice. It holds too much moisture. You get condensation, and things will rot and turn into a science experiment in there. So take a look at different options for bagging your plants as the seed develops and that will help. Seeds are alive and they're basically living plants. They just haven't quite happened yet. Each seed is an embryo and it's got everything in that seed that that embryo needs to germinate and to put a root down and those seed leaves to get them out into the sun where they can photosynthesize so the root can start drawing moisture. There's a lot of energy stored in those seed leaves and that is what grows your plant to the point where it puts out true leaves and begins to develop its own energy from photosynthesizing. So when you're harvesting your seeds, be gentle, be kind, don't damage your seeds because you are possibly damaging the embryo that is within the seed coat. And you want to label everything with the full name, not just the, the variety name, but it, make sure you know it's a lettuce or a cucumber or a squash. And then if it's a cucumber, is it a lemon cucumber? Is it a white cucumber? Is it a, a, a market more cucumber? Use the dates that you harvested so you know about when that plant was coming to seed, keep records of these things, and the kind of cultural information, what it did that year that made it so remarkable and special that it was worth saving seed from that plant. Um, those are the characteristics that have made it valuable to you. You want to clean that seed, removing seed from pods or off stems, um, and winnow them to get the chaff and the plant debris out and allow that seed to completely dry. Again, we can put it out in just a, a container on a counter. Uh, outside, sometimes we get awfully windy. It has to be a very protected place outside. If they're contained in bags and paper bags, they're safer. But don't let the bags blow over. You'll have seed everywhere, except where you want it. And then again, like those spices that we were saving in the cupboard, I put seeds in the freezer for a couple of days just to kill any wildlife that might want to hitch a ride. You can do a germination test on seeds. You can do it after you've collected them, but some seed actually needs a period of dormancy before it will germinate. So it's better to do your germination test a little later on, um, but prior to planting out. And a germination test is simply laying some seeds between a damp paper towel and dating that putting that paper towel in a plastic bag and zipping it closed. And then on the bag, you put the variety and the date you put them in there. And keep an eye on them. Most seed is seven to 10 days, but there are exceptions. Parsley will definitely take 21, easily 21 days. So you put the variety of what you're seeding and look it up and start looking to see how many of those seeds are germinating in three or four days, in five or six days, in 10 days. And that gives you an idea of the percentage of viability that your seeds will have, which will influence the way that you plant them in the garden. And then when you've got them ready for storage, they go into well-labeled airtight containers and try to keep them in a cool, dry place out of direct sunlight. Freezers and refrigerators are absolutely ideal. Um, hot garages, on a shelf, probably not the best place to keep your seeds. So be thoughtful about where you're keeping seeds and let that partially drive how many seeds you choose to collect. So I'm gonna just touch base on a couple of very familiar varieties that we grow. Um, they've got some special handling that you might 
as you read about them, you'll run into again, but just a couple of heads up. Plants with fruits or pods, this is a very young, tender okra. And to harvest the seed from that okra, you would allow that pod to fully mature and it turns brown or tan and it starts to crack on these seam lines, at which point you can then harvest it and your seeds will be ready for storage. Peas, you want to mature on the vine till they're this, the pod is quite crispy and hard. And then you collect them in a paper bag. Those little pods with their sharp tips are death on plastic grocery bags. They'll cut a hole and escape out the bottom when you're not looking. Um, so as you go through this, the cycle, collect them, allow them to dry, shell the seed gently, freeze it, package it, label and store it. And that one would be red burgundy okra. He's a nice heirloom. Tomatoes, peppers, tomatillos, and eggplants. These are our Solanaceae tribe. Um, let them get really ripe on the vine. Eggplants, when they get really ripe, turn yellow. They get kind of hard and they turn yellow, gold, orange, depending on the variety. They, you start seeing that's when they are getting ready. Um, Tomatillos will start to pop out of their skins. They'll get really squishy. Tomatoes can get a little bit squishy. So you want to squeeze the seeds out or scoop the seeds out. And they all benefit from a period of fermentation. So tomato seeds are easy. You put them in a glass and put some water in, stir it up good and put it on the shelf and it'll start to bubble and perk in a couple of days and you leave it for three or four days and scrub them up, clean them up good, dry them. Freezer paper is good to dry things on. Wax paper is pretty good. Parchment paper is pretty good. Paper towels, they stick to. Fabric, they stick to. You'll really have trouble getting a dry seed off something that's not fairly slickery. So keep an eye, you know, you can put them on a plastic bag, but not in a plastic bag to dry and then capture them, rinse them well, dry them, package label. But that fermentation removes a layer that is over the seed coat that prevents germination. If your tomato falls to the ground, it will ferment in place and get gooky and gooey, allowing those tomatoes when the temperatures are right, those tomato seeds to germinate should you not get the garden cleaned up well enough. Um, so if the pepper, I've got chiltepines, the birds eat the chiltepines. The seeds go through the bird and during the digestion process, the seed gets scarified and is able to germinate easily. There's chiltepines all over my garden. Melons, watermelons, cucumbers are all members of the cucurbit family. Sativus, which is cukes, won't cross with mellows, which are squash uh, or melons, and they won't cross with pepos, which are squash. But if you are planting a cucumber that is a pickler and a cucumber that is a slicer and you've got a lemon, they will all intermingle quite happily and the seed you harvest will give you something interesting the following year. Melons, if you've got honeydews and you've got cantaloupes and you've got a couple of other heirlooms kicking around and Mother Mary's in there somewhere, you'll get some interesting melons. And we've all had compost melons that have popped up kind of volunteered in our garden and some of us get pretty good melons some of them weren't worth leaving in the garden for so just be aware that you need some real distances and you have to take charge when you are harvesting seed for those and you're doing your own pollination and then you're covering your pollinated fruits with bags those fabric bags will go and that'll keep them from being cross-pollinated by bees from things that you're not looking for. Flowers for seed saving calendulas are just easy as pies, zinnias, compo, cosmos, sunflowers, absolutely. Larkspur and all the poppies, easy seed saving. 
perennials. We can save seed from coreopsis and salvias, penstemons. We grow lots of penstemons there. And of course, the hollyhocks in the background on this slide, all good candidates. You can save them by color, by height, by all kinds of criteria, such as heat tolerance, the size and shape of the plant. How long are the stems? Are they good for cut flowers or do they just get floppy in the garden and become untidy? Um, are they open pollinated? We're really looking for those open pollinated flowers to keep and sustain our pollinators. We're looking for pest and disease resistance. So if you keep pulling a variety out because it is not healthy, maybe you don't want to save seed from that variety and go look for something with more vigor. Some of them are more tolerant of less water than others. And this is your, you know, the ones that have done well at the edge of the irrigation without being stressed or might be a good candidate. That list to be determined is yours. And when we're looking at saving seed from herbs, basils can be kind of promiscuous. So if you've got many basils in your garden and you save seed, you may get some basils that don't taste like you remember the mother plant tasting, and that's okay. If they taste good and you're enjoying them, harvest away. If you don't like the flavor, the flowers are great for the bees, but this would not be a basil you would save seed from another year. And pretty much ditto with most of the herbs. Um, leaf celery is a great old celery seed. Fresh is good to eat. It's nice. That one I will let sell. So celery is really picky about germinating. And if I get enough seed out there, I know I'll get plants. Hibiscus subdifera, which is pictured here on the slide. These are the calyxes, which surround is the, the botanical term for that juicy thing that is surrounding a seed pod. You'll see a spent flower here. There'll be a seed pod tucked in there. It's the calyx that we use along with the, the foliage is edible but the seed pod is tucked in there safe and sound. We harvest those when they are beginning to just show signs of popping open and cracking, just like that okra. And again, we're selecting the ones that did really well, that taste really good, and that are what we're looking for. There's an incredible number of natives we can save seed for, and our Arizona plantsmen have done in the last 35 or 40 years, have done a tremendous job of developing ways of saving native plant seeds, collecting it, and learning to grow it out so that when we go into our nurseries, we have a tremendous variety of native Sonoran desert plants to plant in our gardens. They've discovered many tricks of the trade as homeowners, as hobbyists, we too can learn some of those tricks. It just takes research and time and experimentation. But research, 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 and this is the devil's claw. It is edible as a vegetable in the tender state, but it's um, an herb. It is a medicinal. It's used in basket weaving. It's used in crafts. It's a great plant. Um, there are some challenges to seed saving. Disease seed, and seed can get diseased easily. There's climate and weather challenges, space, and the perpetual problem of our favorite pests and our not so favorite pests. The most common diseases that can be carried on seed um, include bacterial problems, viruses, and fungi. If the plant is infected with various spots and cankers and, and wilts, you do not want to save seed from it because the seed from that plant will, will carry that disease into the next generation. So those diseased plants need to be removed from the garden so they don't share the disease with the other parts of that crop. Um, dispose of them in plastic bags in the trash, please. They don't even go in compost. Seaborne disease is favored in areas with rainy, humid condition. Temperatures, depending on the crop and the climate, vary from cool to hot, but it is humid. So a lot of the challenges seed savers in other parts of the country experience are not as big a challenge to us because we do not have the humidity that fosters those diseases so successfully. Some of those diseases can be localized in the plant, and some of them are localized 
on the seed externally. So some of them are systemic within the plant tissue and gets transferred into the seed that way. Some of it, it gets picked up as the seed is exposed to those diseases on the plant itself. So be aware of the health of your plants. You wanna select only the healthy plants for seeds and dispose of anything that isn't long before it's making seed. Keep your work areas clean, wash your seed cleaning equipment, use clean storage containers. And there's some really interesting um, work being done on using hot water baths to reduce disease in seed borne disease in collected seeds. So there's some temperatures, I've got three pubs that I included in this and there's some good information. And they're, these people are, they're just staying up with the current technology. And instead of using a pot of hot water on the stove with a thermometer, they're going sous vide. And they've got that controlled environment completely. And they know how many minutes, depending on the variety, and they can hold that temperature absolutely at the right temperature for the necessary time. And then they dehydrate those seeds quickly, get that moisture out so you don't get germination, but the seed coat is no longer carrying the disease to the soils and to the next plant along. Birds, rodents, insects love seed. We were trying to do mustard seed in the demo garden this year. The birds didn't have any interest in the flowers. We did get seed pods, but boy, once they started setting seed, they really liked those seeds and they were going into those pods and eating our seeds long before the seed was anywhere near developed. Sometimes all the fencing in the net just isn't a world, isn't enough net and fencing. So be prepared for frustrations and challenges and competition. If you're using means to control pests, try to use as organic a process as you can. You don't want to use herbicides because that may challenge the seed viability later on when you try to plant them out. So be really careful in how you're managing your pests. Climate, oh, do we have climate? Plants here often are mature and they're blooming and everything's just perfect and we get too hot. And all those beautiful flowers, the pollen is no longer viable and you don't get any seeds at all, or you get a few from the first ones that bloom and all the rest of the flower heads are just show and no go. So then you're stuck with not as many seeds and you really have to take care of them. Sometimes the aphids come in with that same climate and you find your seed heads just covered with aphids, piercing and sucking the life juices out of all of those little embryos. This is not fun. And sometimes we need a longer season of that season in order for that plant to reach the point of maturity where it goes into the seed making phase. And people in other climates very carefully dig up their root vegetables and tuck them into cool sand and root cellars and then plant them out the following spring to get the rest of the development. Here, finding a cool spot to hold root vegetables can be a challenge. So we have to kind of gear our collecting around what resources we have for keeping plants through to the next season. Those biennials are tough here. Climate, too hot and too cold. The pollen isn't viable. You'll have blooming plants, but the pollen just won't work. And the plants will fail. We get a hot snap somewhere and the plant just wants to die and it will just short circuit itself and you won't get, it won't complete that flower seed cycle at all. Um, our seasons are really short. Some days you just can't get that plant all the way through the process, no matter how hard you try. And as urban gardeners, we are often faced with the challenge of space and having enough room in our gardens to plant sufficient plants to harvest and to harvest seed from can be a challenge. Always store in suggested containers in cool, dark places well labeled with the date of collection, the cultural inf information, the varietal information, expectations. Always rotate your stock and share with your fellow gardeners, whether you've, you're sharing plants you started or the seeds. What's next? 
each season do a viability test to make sure the oldest seeds in your collection are still viable enough to germinate when you plant them. Do all the soil prep just like you would for any seed. Plant seasonally like you should for any seed. Just keep it on track. Keep records. Figure out whether your home collected seed is as successful in, and how successful it is. Are you getting better production from the ones? Do some tests. Plant, buy some seed. Plant some seed you've collected. See if your, your homegrown seed is becoming adapted to our climates. And if seed grows out disappointingly a couple of years in a row, definitely don't keep it and keep doing it. Short list of catalogs. We've got seed savers. They're wonderful. They are, you know, they wrote the book. Native seeds here in Tucson have ch faced the challenges of the desert, uh, four or five deserts actually, and are doing grow outs and collecting seeds from several deserts and making them available to gardeners. Rareseeds.com, we know it is Baker Creek, Territorial, Nichols, Victory, and High Mowing all do a lot of their own seed contract growing so that the seeds they're selling, they know the growers for those seeds and they are growing heirloom seeds out so that we have resources. And you can find lots of other catalogs. This is a short list. But there's lots and lots of catalogs with good collections of heirloom seeds to start your seed growing and saving projects with. Seedborne disease, these are the three pubs. They're worth looking at. It's really interesting. I had no idea how much disease could be carried by seeds. I'm definitely thinking about this much more seriously than I was earlier on this year. Um, oops, back up one. And other resources, um, Colorado State has some good pubs on saving seed, practical advice. William Woyes Weber grows vegetables and seeds in Pennsylvania. He's in that perfect zone six belt. He can grow almost anything out there. It's kind of diabolical. And he's been pioneering seed saving for decades. Um, the Vegetable Gardener's Guide to Growing and storing vegetable and flower seeds is a very, very compact little book. And the Complete Guide to Growing and Saving Seeds is a useful resource as well. So there's some good books on the subject you can investigate further if the information in the catalog and what you find Googling things doesn't quite meet all your needs. So I think at this point, I am going to stop the slides and open this up to questions. Do we have anybody left? <laughs> yeah, we have some people left. Is there anyone that has any questions? You can either type in the box or you can unmute yourself and um, ask Pam your question. And I'm trying to get out of my slideshow here. So many great resources. Thank you, Pam. You know, I like resources. I like books. <laughs> I'm, I'm a real sucker for books. So. so, there we go. Stop sharing. Here we go. Bye-bye. <laughs> There's everybody. Hi. So, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. No questions. Come on. Somebody's got to have a question. We'll give everyone a minute in case they're typing. You, pro you provided information on like everything. So you probably answered everybody's questions. Oh, there's a whole lot of things <laughs> I didn't even delve into. They got complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for attending, Kathy. Well, I'm glad everybody could make it. Um, Hope to see you all somewhere in a garden soon. <laughs> yeah, and definitely, um, if you haven't already, I know some of you, some of you have, um, definitely visit the seed library at Sunset. Um, we've gotten quite a few pack packets of seeds from um, uh, Baker Creek Native Seed Search Seed Savers, um, the Herb Association, and um, our Chandler Environmental Education Center. 
and I know I'm missing, I'm missing more, <laughs> but, but, um, we've got some really good seeds and, and a, a household can come in. You, you just, you have to have a valid library card. You can check out up to three packets of seeds a month. And then if you ever want to donate, um, seeds back to us, you can do that. So it's a pretty neat system. So there's a brief question about what is the treatment on seeds which harms pollinators? Um, probably the most known problem with treating growing plants, and if it's and, and it's a systemic, it's the nicot nicotinoids. Um, it's a derivative of nicot nicotiana or nicotine. Um, it is very toxic to insects. It is a very effective pest control, but it is broad spectrum and it'll kill the ones you don't want, but it is also deadly to the good bugs, the beneficial insects and the pollinators. So when we're shopping for plants, we're asking for plants that are not treated with nicotinoids, nicotinoids, um, and if you, the seeds that you're buying are labeled as meeting the requirements of the USDA organic gardening criteria, those will not have been treated with the, the neonics. But and it's something to be aware of. There's a lot of, of use of the neonics to, pre, to keep the pest problems in large growing fields down. But it when you bring them into the garden, they stay viable for a very long time in the plant. And if it goes to seed, if it's an old enough plant, it would be possibly viable in the seed. It might have probably less harm to the insects, but maybe more harm to the seed. Does that make sense? Just say that again, more harm to the... To the to the seed itself, rather oh. than to the insect. When okay. it's taken up internally, because you're growing an embryo when you're growing a seed. And there can be some damage with the use of, of herbicides and pesticides. And it isn't something that for the home gardener is researched terribly well. Um, it's the industry issue, I think. So we ask for things that are not treated with neonics and challenge um, our nursery people to have plants that are not treated with harsh chemicals that will affect the good bugs in our gardens that are already there. So even if you were just buying like alfalfa seed to make your own sprouts with, that would be an important consideration then that you want an organic yeah, and you will find that packages for sprouting are labeled for sprouting. Right, I've seen that, but I didn't know why they would have to be specifically for yeah, sprouting. Yeah, because sometimes seed is treated for things for storage that we wouldn't want to, con we would not want to be consuming. Planted in the ground, it might not be a problem. And there are people who despair of buying seeds treated for fungus, but there's a lot of seeds you can buy that are treated for fungus. And some of those are fairly heavy duty fungal preventers, but if the seeds are known carriers of soil fungus diseases that will kill a plant, better that there is no, you know, it's, it's, it, there's a, a decision to be made by gardeners on the, the level of organic that you and that you want to pursue and what is effective in the soils in your garden. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There is another you know, how question. How they get from seed from a seedless cucumber. Oh, that's a lovely question. Oh, you got it. <laughs> um, they breed a cucumber. Mom has got the capacity to mate with a cucumber. It's a diploid, tetraploid arrangement, but the he and the she mate, they make a plant, but the plant doesn't have any reproduction capacity, so it doesn't make seeds. They have bred that out, so 
that is a one-off. You get your seedless cucumbers. If it even makes things that look like seeds, they won't be viable. And they make, and for the seed crop to grow the next year's crop, they're breeding back over here, the next set of parents. So there's like a three-stage grow out to get that final seed that plant you plant that has no seeds at the end. It's all to do with hybridizing. Does that make sense? Did that help? <laughs> no wonder, yes, exactly. You take very good care of those little guys. And for the most part, if we scoop the seeds out and pick our cucumbers young, we can eat pretty good cucumbers without going to that extreme. Any other questions? Okay, well, if, um, if anyone does have any questions that you think of um, after tonight, you can definitely feel free to email me. I can pass them along to Pam. Um, and then if you got those uh, research sheets I emailed out earlier, definitely check those out. A lot of good stuff on there. Um, Pam, is there anything else you'd like to share? No, thank you all okay. for coming. Hey, thank you so very much. It's such an excellent presentation. I really appreciate your time. Bye. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming, everybody, and we'll see yeah. you in the garden somewhere. <laughs> okay. Good night. Good night.